The service on this Sunday, November 11th, was Memory Tree Sunday. In this annual ritual of remembrance, we honor the memory and gifts of loved ones we have lost. Reverend Karen Anderson will present her original story, Holding On to Ruth, and as a reminder to own the flow of our days rather than having the flow of days own us. A child's view doesn't always do something justice. What I remember was how cold and hard the floor was. Musty and dusty with hundred-year-old orientals scattered throughout that living room that were kind of worn, but then there were two inches below the foot pedals on two Steinway Grants, <laughs> rubbed raw like the driver's pad in a car from stiletto or boot or soft soles that had taken their heel plunged into woven layers and torn it away. And where I sat was under the grand piano in Ruth's living room. But that space of four by five feet that was kind of encased and yet open, oh, it could just make your heart kind of swell underneath there. See, my mother and Ruth were neighbors and they played piano together. At the same time, an identical Steinway Grands sat next to neck in Ruth's large Edwardian living room. And together they played these Brahms Hungarian dances, each crashing through treble and bass clef and arpeggios and kind of 15 inch stretches. Ruth, in her younger years, had gone to Juilliard for a piano recital that had moved back because her love for Henry pulled her more than kind of the blood, sweat, and tears of Rachmaninoff and Schubert. So she moved back home and married Henry and taught piano. Now when I say she taught piano, I don't mean she taught people who were 60 coming new to piano or a seven-year-old using those red, Thompson beginner books. You know which ones I'm talking about? No, no. She had a tutelage of about five people that she played with. And they were kind of an elite band of adults that could only keep up with Ruth. They were the kind of people who had gone to Oberlin or St. Olaf or Eastman and had studied, either majored or minored in piano themselves. But as their vocation, they went into something else. But their avocation, they wanted to be kind of very disciplined about their work. And they did. They were some of the few people that could keep up with the fortitude and the ease of elegance to play and learn with somebody like Ruth. Now the thing about Ruth was she had some unusual practices. <coughs> she asked of all five of her students that they bring one of their children along to each lesson every time they came. And so everybody did. They'd pick one kid, but you had a big rule. You couldn't just sit there and listen to this kind of crashing of pianos going at each other or at the ease of the back and forth with the two of them. No, no. You had to sit underneath the piano while the lesson was going on. And that's how you spent the entire hour. While, of course, Ruth would shout out to whoever it was that she had, she was teaching at the time, fortissimo here, staccato, quick, 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 quick. Move on, move on, ease into this, Joan, ease in, she'd say. Now, almost every time that I would go, somebody else would be finishing their lesson, so I'd have the last 10 minutes of having to watch some other kid in my space underneath the piano. And sure enough, they'd all have a different way of doing it. One kid lied back with his hands out behind him, kind of spread eagle, like he was making a snow angel and his head turned to the side. Another little girl named Eleanor, she'd kind of pull herself into the fetal position and just rest on the whole time. 
And I'd get so antsy and angry with them, you got to get out of there because it's my turn. And sure enough, they'd be done with their lesson and they'd leave. And I'd get to go underneath the piano. And I'd take off my shoes and my socks and I'd lie flat down with my back straight up and I'd put my feet on the bottom of that piano so I could feel everything and those hammers just inches away, hitting away as we went along. For us kids, it really was this safe place, this privileged place, a sanctuary. For Ruth, the piano gave her relationships with the others. The piano was her means to relationships with her students that made her come alive. It kind of animated her. It animated the people that she studied so hard with. She got married before the war, and then her husband got drafted and got killed by the Germans, leaving Ruth with a war baby and little support. So she raised a son on her own with a great deal of help from a wealthy aunt. But then her son was biking to the grocery store once as a teenager, and a bus came too close to him and killed him as well. And Ruth had no siblings or aunts, really, except this one aunt who died then, or uncles or parents. Her family were her students. And she used that piano to share an intimacy between those she loved and taught. Not in a weird or unusual way, but in a way that sometimes people can have between their muse or between their art on occasion gets translated <coughs> to humans. They ignited in her something she couldn't ignite herself. Kind of like an inner spark, but more a relational spark. And every year they hope hold this kind of open recital in that large living room and anybody of noteworthy anything in town would come to that recital. And the Lutheran Women's Club would always come and they'd make sure that they got the front row seats and the best little triangle sandwiches, of course. <laughs> and each year, my mother and her friends would provide this grand concert this masterpiece of their works. And in honor and recognition of Ruth, for a number of years, they tried to outdo each other with some kind of gift that would capture kind of that enduring respect and love they had for this woman. And then about five years into that annual recital, Ruth stood up before the entire thing, and she said, it's not that I don't value and love your gifts. I do. You are my people. This is our work together. But please, I want you to take back the flowers that you're going to give me and give to the cashier who's been standing there for 12 hours. <laughs> the new earrings to your wife or your girlfriend, I want you, that you were thinking of giving to me, I want you to give to them. That signed copy of Harry Potter, give to your nephew. Take them home with you. What I ask from here on out is an expression of love that we share together. And for the next couple of years, I'm going to ask you to bring me tokens of the stories and wisdom we've found together. And then I want you to leave them in this kind of tray that I'm going to leave on the grand piano as a means to remind each other of the joint work that we do as a way to honor our relationship and something that captures those experiences that we've had and held with one another. Like an offering on a grave that you would do an appreciation for someone. But I want it while I'm still alive. <laughs> then she finished by saying, every time it rains, I go up to the attic and I open up this old chest that I have. My folks brought it back with them from the old country. And I pull out all the belongings that have stories behind them or remind me of those I've loved and lost. And sometimes I bring them down here to the mantel or I put them on the dining room table for a while. Sometimes when I'm up there, I feel like they're dancing with me, that they're all alive back again, all those times I've had with them. And it's not creepy or weird. 
just a touchstone. And it struck me, how come we don't do this while we are alive? How come we don't share that piece of what we give and need and trust and respect with each other? So after I give you some wisdom, or you give me some, I want in the tray nothing further, just a piece of what happened between us. So for a minute in the room, it was quiet. Then Ruth bowed to everybody, and she started the recital. Now over the next couple of years, I'd go and I'd see all these things added to the tray all the time. But I never had enough courage really to ask what they were about. Then a little bit later, my mother died. I was in my late 20s. And I took care of gathering everything up and auctioning off, and I moved into her house and redid things. I'm a very practical person. I am good at that kind of thing. And Ruth, when that happened, saw me do that for my mother, and she asked me to do the same for her when she died someday. And I was hoping beyond hope that it would be a while longer. But then in the spring, when it came that the magnolias kind of just all popped open that one day, I got a call that Ruth died. And I took care of all of those things in her house that I had done exactly for my mother. I called an auction house, and they came and decided what to get rid of. I called a realtor. And the only thing really that was left in her living room were those two giant pianos, a stereo system, and a few chairs. And they felt like kind of giant taxidermed elephants, <laughs> lifeless and unfeeling, a weight rather than a light. They had always been. And as I walked through that house, waiting for the realtor to come, the auctioneer came and he said, Julie, we got rid of everything, but Ruth wanted you to have this. And he hands over to me the tray with everything that they had collected. And I thought to myself, what am I going to do with this? And he starts walking out, and he said, oh, I forgot. She left you this, too. And he pulls out an envelope, and on it, it has <coughs> Ruth's scripted very lovely signature with a note inside. And it said this, Julie, gather the musicians in the living room and sit in a circle and share the tray. They'll know what to do. And when the time is right, you'll know too. I don't want a memorial or a fanfare or a panache. I want these people in my house talking about what we shared together, the life, the music, our creation, our joint muse. So I called up all four of them, except, of course, for my mother. And I said, why don't you come on Saturday, about 10 o'clock? And they did. They brought donuts and coffee and arms full of all these scores that they had played together. We sat in a circle. And I told them about the letter that Ruth had left for me. But I said to them, I'm not entirely sure I get this. Does she want you to take back these things? And Mark says, I think she does. So Mark takes out of that tray, a tube of toothpaste. And he says, about 10 years ago, when I was a junior in high school, I got picked on a lot. Got called a lot of names and bullied, and nobody really got me. Not my parents or my friends. The only person who got me was Ruth. And I used to come here and just crash through pieces with her. And I often complained about how it felt like I was being spat on all the time. 
and what might be the best way to get back at some of these people. And after weeks of doing that, finally Ruth leaves the room and she comes back with a tube of toothpaste and a plate. And she says to me, I want you to take all of your anger and it's in that tube. She says, now I want you to take all of that and splat it out on the plate. So I did. And it just felt so good. Whenever do you get to do all of that? And all that anger I had for all those people just came out. And I just felt like <laughs> so much better. <laughs> and then she says to me, now I want you to put it back in. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to pull it back in, hoping there was like some vacuum thing that would pull it all back in, but it didn't do that. And then she says to me, Mark, that's what people have been doing to you, spewing you with toothpaste. And it's like our words. Once you spew them out, you can't get them back in again. She said to me, I don't want you saying anything to all those people who have done that to you. If anything you understand, it's what it's like to have toothpaste all over you. She said, when you get that angry and upset, I want you to come at any time and we will crash through pieces together and you can get out all of that anger. She says, but I know you to be somebody of much more strength and character and to have more emotional intelligence than to do that to someone else. And Mark sat there with that tube of toothpaste and he just closed his eyes. Next up was George, and he took the stuffed animal off that tray, and he says, you know what this is for? And we looked at George. Well, we didn't know what it was. He said, a couple years ago, I came in for my lesson, and the front door was open like it always is, and I came in, I was ready to have some tea with Ruth, and uh, I couldn't find her. I yelled into the kitchen, Ruth! I walked to the parlor, Ruth, they yelled up the stairs, hey, Ruth. And I walked into the living room. It was late afternoon, and there was a good 20 feet of just bright, low sunshine that came out through those bay windows right over the top of one of those grand pianos. And there was Ruth lying on top of the grand piano, curled up with a pillow under her head like a cat falling asleep in the sunshine. She was 71, for God's sake. And I thought to myself, that seems so odd. And I walked over and I put my hand on Ruth and she looks up at me and she says, oh, you're here. Let's get started. And we didn't say anything else about that after that. And something happened to me. I grew up thinking people like that were kind of odd or strange. And yet, I realized there was something about Ruth that made her so comfortable in her own skin. It did not matter what anybody thought of her. And for half an hour during that lesson, that's all I thought about. What a great gift that was to meet somebody and know somebody so well that they had no self-consciousness about who they were. Then Joan took out this umbrella. <laughs> Joan, you see about four years beforehand, had been married for 32 years. 
And then one day she went to go print something off of her computer and she went and looked at the printer. And there in the printer was an email from her husband's lover, an explicit email from her husband's lover was meant for her to see. And over the next year, it turns out that he had been having an affair for 31 of the 32 years that they had been married. Now, one of the hardest things, of course, for Joan was this kind of deep sense of betrayal that she had about her life and whether or not things were true or not over and over again. And we all worried about her. So we knew her story, but we didn't know about the umbrella. And Joan says, Remember when Ruth told us that when it rained really hard, she would go up into the attic and be up there? Well, when it rained for me, after Calvin had betrayed me so badly, I always felt like the rain was pelting into my skin all his indiscretion and lies and my naivety, and I just couldn't stand it. And one night, at about 11.30 at night, I came over to Ruth and I pounded and pounded and pounded on that door because I knew that I could see a light up in the attic. She was awake. And she came down, and she looks at me, and she takes off my raincoat. She hangs it up. She goes to her music cabinet, and she pulls out some of the hardest music I have ever had to play in my life, and she made me sight read it on the spot. And I worked so hard and just clamored through that work. And I cried, and I hit it very hard. She puts back on my raincoat and sent me home. And I did that about eight more times, and she kept pulling out work that was harder and harder every <coughs> time I came. And then finally, one time, I came. She took off my raincoat, and she handed me a Chopin piece that Bowie had been working on, a very melodious, kind of lovely piece. It wasn't my favorite, really, but we played it together. And on the walk home that day was the first time ever I felt like the rain wasn't so hard or penetrating. And I felt like something had shifted internally. And then we all talked some more and told some more stories and laughed and cried. And then George and Joan said to me, Julie, can we play some of the Hungarian dances in honor of your mother? And I said, OK, that would be great. And they started in. And at first, I sat there just with my hands in my lap. And I took my shoes off and my socks off, and I climbed underneath that piano. <laughs> And I lied there, and I just closed my eyes. And then I opened my eyes. And above me were all these little notes with all the names of the musicians that she worked with, and their children's names, and my mother's name, and my name, with a picture and I took down the picture of me, which I would, must have been seven or so, curled up underneath the piano. And I turned it over. And it said, Julie, I love you. Thank you for giving me your mother. Love, Ruth. And I yelled out to all of them. I said, you have to stop. Stop playing the piano for a minute. And they said, why? And I said, you got to just trust me on this. I want you to take that exact piece of music and play it on the stereo right now and turn it up loud and then come underneath the piano with me. And they did. And we all wedged ourselves underneath there, shoulder to shoulder. 
And they looked up and they gasped. And they took down the picture of themselves and their children. They put it to their body. And there was Ruth with us, present and not present, and leading us on and not. And we all kind of took a deep breath of that familiar smell of people you know and love so well. And we said, thank you to Ruth. We'll save our, our hymn for another day, but I'd still have us offer this blessing and then we'll end with our closing words. The blessing that I offer is a poem from the poet named Elizabeth Roberts. And she writes this. When I die, if, if you need to weep, cry for your brother or sister walking in the street beside you. And when you need me, Put your arms around anyone and give them what it is that you need to give me. I want to leave you something, something better than, than words or sounds. Look for me in the people I've known or loved, and when you cannot give me away, at least let me live in the gentleness and goodness of your eyes, and not simply in the frozen memories of your mind. You can love me most by letting hands touch hands, by letting bodies touch bodies, and by holding tight to children who so often need more than we can possibly see. Love does not die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. Blessed be. Now, with the hands of the persons next to you, I'd ask you to stand. with me are our chalice extinguishing words. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Go in peace. Go in love. Join us for worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. at the Unitarian Universalist Church of Canandaigua, a welcoming congregation. We are located at 3024 Cooley Road, four miles west of South Main Street, Canandaigua, just north of the intersection with routes 5 and 20. Look for the blue signs just before the turn. Your comments about this program or questions about the church are welcome at 585 three nine six one three seven zero, or at our website www.canandaguauu.org Producer and Editor Daniel Brigham <laughs>